Craig, how is counseling this week? Oh, this one stood out. This was a keeper. This goes down in the journal. And found myself at one point feeling like a ringleader. My counselor, wonderful woman who's really on to some things in me that that need to be addressed and have surfaced as a result of a couple of years of um, some traumatic chemo and cancer events. And she diagnosed or suggested that I was PTSD and we're working through a number of things there in it. <laughs> At one point, John, I was in the chair and I was comfortable and my eyes are closed. And she's just asking questions and out pops this third grade Craig who was traumatized. Then there was this younger Craig still in a crib. And then there was the seventh grade Craig. And then there was a chemo brain Craig. And then someone there was an original Craig. Or, <laughs> the true Craig. Or, or some <laughs> Craig. Another Craig. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, buddy. she's trying to integrate all these different younger, battered traumatized, abused kids, mm -hmm. and it was just amazing to feel your being in five or six pieces. Yeah, right, right. And what I want to say is, of course, of course, the trauma of multiple near-death moments, and not just that, because in some ways, you know, for the Christian, you're like, Great, let's go home. But the trauma around it, the pain, the suffering, the medical, the up and down. I mean, Craig just mercifully to say, of course, mm -hmm. of course, of course. And so proud of you and so grateful that you are seeking now, that your body's doing a little better, seeking now some restoration for your soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the commitment to not only grow but to profit from the heartache and to know that there's a connection, of course, between the current suffering, the post-traumatic stress of mm -hmm. all that you have gone through over these four and a half years, but also that we have a past that actually is connected to our present. There's mm -hmm. trauma in your past mm -hmm. and trauma is trauma and it's going to echo from one to the other and bring both to the surface. So mm -hmm. your courage to – Engage. It's so laudable. It's so good. Friends, welcome to the Ransom Heart Podcast. You're obviously dropping in on a conversation underway. John Eldridge here with Craig McConnell and our pal Dan Allender, who is in town this week to do some planning and fleshing out on the March conference that Dan and I are giving here in Colorado Springs on restoration, on restoring the soul, restoring the heart. And I think that – just back to your story for a minute, Craig. I think people will start really tracking with this very quickly that we are adults and things happen to us in our adult lives. But suddenly we have a reaction to those things that doesn't seem appropriate to the current event. You know, someone has harsh words for us. We get a bad report at work, whatever it is. There's a betrayal and a friendship. And yep, there's normal, healthy adult reactions to all that. But then there's what feels like previously traumatized places, to use your idea, Dan, that weren't addressed and that weren't healed. And now they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're back up and a little embarrassed on this story. But yesterday, Blaine was flying back up to his graduate school program to defend his master's thesis, and it was a big deal, snowstorm in Colorado, and his flight was canceled. And so there's this scrambling to get him on another flight and get him there in time, and any flight they could put him on would get him there too late. And so it was looking bad. Uh. And my reaction to the event didn't seem – what's the word I'm looking for? Like – Compensarate. Yes. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> You know, it didn't seem appropriate, compensate. It didn't seem on the same level as the event. I'm having a much stronger emotional reaction, which lets me know, oh, there are unattended things in my soul that are 
also reacting to the current event as well as adult John, you know. And like you were saying, Craig, that, you know, adult you is needing to work through some very real things of PTSD as suffering. But my goodness, these younger places and what their experience of the chemo has been, we are not yet whole. Well, the phrase I often hear people say is, I just don't feel like myself. And that is actually quite true. But then when you don't feel like yourself, what generally happens is people get harsher, more and more critical mm. of themselves mm. for not being themselves mm. and reacting either way under or way over than their so-called normal self. Yeah. And that moment of actually saying, well, don't think of yourself as just a unitary single being. You actually know that when you're with good buddies – there's a certain part of you that comes out. Yeah. You're in another setting. Another portion of you comes out. So you know that in some ways it isn't just the clothing you wear, that there is a kind of difference within us. And the more we take seriously the fact that we've got major significant moments related to our past that play out in the present, mm -hmm. it may seem really complex and mm -hmm. overwhelming, but actually – allows a new kind of simplicity to say, I've got to deal with that part mm. of me, not just whom I think I am in this moment. Oh, my goodness. And the hope that wholeheartedness is available, right? I mean, coming back to the promise of Christ in Isaiah 61, I have come to give you wholeheartedness. Yeah, yeah. I think we miss what the actual promise is, the offer is. I've come to heal the brokenhearted, set the captive free. And I think we hear that and go, oh, well, he's talking about those who are grieving, who have lost someone. Or, you know, we typically use brokenhearted in that kind of, you know, there's been a loss of love or a loss of a dream or – and those things are true. But Christ is talking about an offer of wholeheartedness. But the idea that shalom implies that there is a kind of – brokenness, scatteredness. Mm -hmm. And to go, we know that's in the world. We know that's true with regard to the holidays and trying to deal with our families. But why would we not presume that that would be true of our central sense of self? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we see it broken in the world, but we're broken people. Mm -hmm. And opening the door to addressing the parts of us related to significant heartache, mm -hmm. trauma, loss, shame, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm actually ought to be part of the redemptive process that we see as not finished at any one point, but a progressive movement mm. that he is recapturing yes, for is. us our humanity and allowing us to become more of who we were meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. Craig, is there a growing at least hope towards wholeheartedness for you in this season? Yes. You know, the first couple of sessions, my counselor was alluding to trauma's effect upon me on a scale that it was hard for me to accept. And it's taken a while to hear what she's saying and then to own it and then to see it operating. And it seems like we're moving in a direction where I'm learning to have a whole lot more compassion mm. on these different places and that I had no idea on most of them that they even played a role in my life. Yeah. I mean, you know, you go through that thing of uh, seeing something very clearly and then you wonder, am I, am I just making this up? Yeah. But if there wasn't the hope of restoration, of integration, of healing, I don't know how up for this I'd be. I don't know what the point would be. That's huge. Let's just name something and hopefully disarm it, I think would be super helpful for people. It's not a source of shame that we are broken, all of us. Now, we experience it as shame or in the context of shaming, but you want to say, of course you are, dear one. Like your heart and soul was made for Eden, it was made for paradise. Your heart and soul was not made for this war-torn world. Mm -hmm. And while the heart and soul are on one hand extraordinarily resilient things, I mean, it's just staggering what people go through and can come out on the other side, you know. 
at the same time, the heart and soul are also very tender and beautiful things and, frankly, easily broken. Mm -hmm. And so just to get the stigma off of – I mean, you and I, Craig, have had numerous conversations about this, about, you know, that what is this stigma I feel that I'm broken coming out of cancer? And obviously, you're still in the long-term battle of all that. But, like, why the shame? What's with that? Well, the assumption of if you've got multiple parts in you, then you're freaking crazy. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then add to that the sense of discouragement mm, that comes go. with – even if we don't have language for it, a praying and fasting and studying scripture and being with friends and sometimes even seeing good therapists and – Literally seeing some movement but not real restoration. Mm, mm. So that interplay mm, mm. at one level, mm. talk about inner world as that broken. I'm I'm zooey. Mm-hmm. You probably don't want to be in relationship with someone this broken. Yeah. And on the other hand, I've done something to try and grow. And where's mm-hmm. it led me? Mm-hmm. Really to a sense that I don't think there's that much of the gospel really at core that will change that deep mm-hmm. inner part of me. Mm-hmm. Well, you yeah. both hit on something I certainly experience, and that's the hiding. You know, one of my symptoms is short-term memory forgetfulness, hard to multitask, focus. And whenever someone suspects that I'm uh, not on my game, I'll lie quickly. Yeah. You know? Hey, do you remember? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because of the shame of just yes. I'm not the guy I used to be. If I were to be really honest and live and what, what's going on, I would be disqualified. It's time to be pushed out into a boat into the mm-hmm. sea, mm-hmm. you know. So it's – you're hitting on things there that are so true. I was on a little bit of a sabbatical last summer, several weeks of just alone time with God. And one of the things I was very struck by – my earlier conceptions of the Christian life were being reframed and kind of what I was journaling on, praying into, realizing, coming to accept was I had thought that the progression of the Christian life was – I don't know that I ever would have put it into these words, but you kind of just get stronger and stronger, better and better. And you sort of reach a place where you and God are good with one another, but sort of as independent beings, whereas what I began to personally experience and then suddenly saw in the life of Paul and then dramatically in the life of Jesus is actually it is a life of greater and greater need and dependence. And it's so counterintuitive. I mean, Jesus saying things like, actually, I don't do anything without God, without my Father. I don't say anything. I don't make any plans. I just – I need him desperately. And you're going, wait, come on. You kind of – really? Like – but then you read the diary of, you know, great saints, you know, down through the ages and you start finding the same thing of that as we go along in our life and in our life with God, we need him more. And I think most of us have been experiencing that as a source of shame. And it's some indication that, man, I'm just not getting this Christian thing down, you know? Like other people sure seem to be fine. And why aren't I finer, better? And again, just to take that stigma off to say, actually, that's the design. The design is deeper and deeper dependence, deeper and deeper need. And in that need and in that dependence, finding restoration rather than some kind of independent strength out of which we sort of relate to God as like a peer or something Mm -hmm. like that. Well, the paradox of what you were putting words to with regard to the heart being really resilient. I mean, what Craig has gone through, what others have gone through in terms of you're literally sitting, talking, I can't believe how much you have suffered. Yet on the other hand, the fragility of the heart, the heart can really be broken And then to say, on the other hand, we are becoming more and more what we were intended to be. Mm -hmm. But yet the Mm -hmm. outer man is fragile Mm -hmm. and is decaying. So Mm -hmm. holding that paradox Mm -hmm. and saying 
somehow as we actually become more enamored by his faithfulness, our heart has a potential to become more faithful. Mm. But the centrality that he does want to restore us to him, yes. to others, yeah. mm. and actually yes. restore us to become ourselves. Yes. I mean, it's all about restoration yeah. in uh, that movement of the heart to say, I yeah. can become not yeah. so much more, but I can be more dependent upon him. Oh, For that restoration. Oh, it just – it, yeah. it becomes – a means by which I say I, I hate the suffering you've endured, but the man you're becoming is so beautiful mm -hmm. that I don't mm -hmm. bless your suffering, but I bless what it has brought you to become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is good. You, too, have spent the last couple of days working on this conference, Restoration of the Heart. And as we're talking, I can't help but wonder, what, what have you come up with? What will you be covering? What are you hoping will happen? I so enjoyed yesterday morning. We were sitting in my living room and we had some post-it note cards out. And I just said, Dan, before we try and figure out sessions, timing, breaks, all that, just what do you want to bring? What three or four, like, if I could impart to a group of people after 30 years of, you know, being a psychologist, here's what I would love to impart Mm. That's where we started. And the mm. conversation from there it was really rich because it whittles it down. You know, like what do you think is really, 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 really important? I mean, your piece on trauma, Dan, I thought was huge. To be honest, as we did it, it was so fun. Just the joy of seeing the categories evolve. I had two thoughts. One was I can't wait to be part of it, but I also can't wait to learn from it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I can't wait to see the video. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, the hope is that people will actually come to believe that restoration is possible. It may yes. seem that simple. Yes. But I think in many ways my own heart has felt at times so discouraged that that if at core my heart wants Jesus and I believe I do, why am I still suffering and struggling certain mm -hmm. things that just feel interminable? Like mm -hmm. it's never going to not be the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that – sense of that's what evil wants, somehow to feel discouraged and ultimately to question the power of God. Yep. Mm. And if we can invite people to that hope of, look, redemption is so good. Yes, heaven will change all things. When you see him, then you will become as he is. So will there always be potential for growth in this mm. life? Yet there is so much more that is available to us that we do not partake of. He has set this beautiful banquet and he wants you to, in some sense, enjoy all that he has mm. brought to us. So mm. that kind of the renewal for me, even mm -hmm. as we were talking of, he has done good work in my heart. But mm. there is so much more mm -hmm. of redemption. Mm -hmm. And yeah. these categories are not just for others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are as much, if not more, for me. Yeah. So talk about the piece on trauma. Talk about that's really surfaced over the years for you as a pretty defining category? Well, trauma has certainly been the nature of my work over 30-some years in terms of particularly the issues of sexual abuse. But I think probably what has evolved in the last 10 years has been much greater clarity about the work of evil, creating the context through trauma of how it intends to break apart the human heart, mm. to create that level of discouragement, self-hatred, shame. So if we're clear that he is really a thief and that thief is going to be working constantly to destroy his sense of goodness, of mm. innocence, mm. and evil mm. is a killer and it's out to destroy. It's not going to primarily work to take your life. It's going to remove life, to re bring a sense of deadness through mm -hmm. dissociation, through addictions, just through hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And evil mars, destroys, and that sense of it wants you to live with accusations, judgments against you, a kind of curse mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. yourself that mm -hmm. there really is no joy. Or if there is, it's very temporary and very sensual rather than eternal mm -hmm. and profound. So the hope of the gospel is that we actually can walk into the damage of trauma. And trauma is any event that has created a sense of betrayal. You've been set up, groomed, and used. And then 
you have felt hopeless. Mm. Uh, you've lost a sense of appropriate power for living in this world. You feel and, powerless. And then with that, a sense of somehow shame of complicity. Somehow I've made a mistake. I trusted this person. Or I felt something in my body that now brings judgment because of what I have felt. Mm -hmm. All that to say trauma is the doorway that evil generally uses so profoundly to bring that sense of there is something evil dark. There is something broken and ugly mm -hmm. within me. And therefore, just as Craig was saying, it's better to hide it. Uh, better mm -hmm. to pose and mm -hmm. create a facade of I'm really quite competent. I'm really quite bright. Mm. I can do this rather than owning mm. I'm actually a very scared little boy mm -hmm. who's very angry and working very hard to mm -hmm. manage his world. If we can only allow ourselves to come with Jesus to those parts that are deeply, deeply harmed and then allow the work of redemption. So that was – a lot of the work that we were putting words to mm -hmm. yesterday of let's mm -hmm. make sure people understand trauma is not just an event that we've resolved. Mm -hmm. It's actually the prime entryway. Now let's look at the debris. Even mm -hmm. though that's not a very desirable thing to do, mm -hmm. let's look at the debris because the debris field, like a crime scene, and that's the whole notion of a story. It's a scene. Mm -hmm. It's a series of scenes. Mm -hmm. And your life is a crime scene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's walk into it, not – brusquely and just go, well, there's the dead body and he's clearly been shot, crime resolved. No, mm. we've got to come in and study, ponder, pray, open our hearts to be clear about what has happened here to have led the heart to be as broken as it is. That's some of the work I'm just excited not just to offer but actually to partake, to partake of myself. Of, yeah. And that idea of hiding, hiding is the only thing in the way of healing. Like the gospel is powerful enough to heal. Restoration is available. Darkness can be vanquished. We have all seen it. We've all ushered it in on behalf of thousands of people. We've experienced it ourselves. But just that little piece that you were mentioning, so therefore we hide, right? Well, that keeps us from bringing it into the light. You know, it's Adam. It's my goodness. It's Genesis 3. You know, I was afraid of exposure and some hiding. And it's really an enormously hopeful thought that actually that hiding is the only thing that's in the way, right? If we will step into these things with Jesus, with the presence of Jesus with us now and in, inside of us now, these things can be addressed. Just as he is so desirous to speak, you know, he's so desirous to heal. And so opening the door to name. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the work of engaging our stories. Mm -hmm. Are we willing to name what was actually true rather than shade it, rather than mm -hmm. polish it off? Mm -hmm. To use language like, well, my father wasn't really there. Yeah. To actually name, no, he had a lot of resentment toward you. Yeah. And he actually made you pay. He was not just abandoning. So as we language reality – it opens the door to a level of we're no longer hiding behind nor blaming. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that second portion of what Adam did in his hiding, he also chose mm. to accuse. And mm. so you know that the mm. evil one is constantly inviting us either to bear accusations against ourselves yeah. or to turn those accusations against mm. others. The resentment is really a deep, deep entry point for the work of evil. I'm going to pause listeners and say, we got to carry this on for another podcast. And so for today, hope this has stirred some things in your heart and soul. We are really excited about the March conference, March 4th and 5th here in Colorado Springs on the restoration of the heart, a two-day experience where we're going to walk you through restoration for men and women. This is not just a men's conference. So more information on our website at ransomedheart.com, and we're just going to pick this right back up next time.